14th of June 2008, in Brandon, a small and apparently peaceful town tucked between trees in Suffolk. Business as usual for the shopkeepers and families and office workers. But this isn't a normal day. And from the surrounding fields will come a danger which will shatter lives. A danger unleashed through a simple act of kindness on a shopping trip. The act of helping a stranger. It happened out of the blue. I'm 12 months on and I'm still struggling to get over it. A stranger who used fear as a weapon, a means of control. It's by far the most terrible experience in my life. I thought, no, no, I knew I was going to die. He's kind of directing her thoughts. He's putting thoughts in her mind. So this is about power and abuse of power and mind control. It's Saturday, eight minutes past two in the afternoon. A 21-year-old girl, we'll call her Jane, has just finished shopping. The victim in the events about to unfold has been closely involved in the production of this documentary. We're making this film because of her courage during her ordeal and in wanting to tell her story to encourage other victims to come forward. The words spoken are hers, but to protect her identity, her role is being played by an actress. Brandon is a, a nice, quiet little country town, market town, um, situated close to the Norfolk border um, within Suffolk. It's surrounded on most sides by large forests, you know, the main one being Thetford Forest. Many years ago, it was an overspill from, from London. And at times, there has been tensions between various communities um, within the town. Has its own problems as far as um, criminality, but you know, nothing out of the ordinary. And um, certainly, the events of June the 14th, 2008, was um, actually shocking for the town, and, and no one actually could believe it. I've always thought of myself as quite practical and sorted. Uh, when I was in school, I was in the army cadets, and thank God for that training, because that's what kept me going. I mean, without it, things might have turned out very differently. Jane had spent the morning at work in a neighboring town. I had come home, quickly changed into simple, casual clothes, and then driven to Tesco's in Brandon to get my weekend shopping. Everything seemed perfectly normal. I was, uh, I was going to take the food to the house I share with my boyfriend. I texted my mum to say once I'd put the shopping away that I'd then head over to their house, which is in a nearby village, and then I put the bags and my phone in the car. But as she headed back to her car, she heard a voice. Just behind my car, another car was parked. There was an oldish guy in his 50s. You couldn't give me a hand with this bag, could you? Sure. It's just that I've got a bad back. I know all about bad backs. I sympathised. I've got a bad back myself. I could feel the bag was pretty empty, which I did think was a bit odd. Also, there wasn't much in the car either. The back seats had been folded down, so the boot was pretty empty. Jane's offer of help? Her willingness to be a good Samaritan was an act for which she would pay dearly. Right, now you get in. It was so, so terrifying. I went into a panic attack. I, I felt I might stop breathing, so, so I started hyperventilating and, and forcing the air down into my lungs. He had the complete upper hand. He had all the power at that point. He'd come prepared, he'd used threats. Everything he had was either physically or emotionally overpowering Jane at that point. He knew the gravity of the offences he was committing, so he, he must have been confident that he was able to carry out that offence, and he, he must have believed that he was going to get away with it. So at this point in time, Jane realises how powerless she really is. This is a guy who's prepared well. Despite how he looks, he's physically strong, he's got the element of surprise, and now he's absolutely terrorising her. So she knows that he holds all the cards, and this is all about the exercise and the abuse of power. I was just <laughs> sobbing uncontrollably. Keep quiet! But whilst my body was doing that, my mind was racing through a million different thoughts. 
At firstly, I was trying to use my army cadet training. I tried to check the time, but my watch had come off. And so I started trying to make a mental list of every stop and start, every turning we took, all the different types of road surface. I thought that by doing that, I could feel I was taking positive steps and I would get out of this alive. But, but then I was also thinking stupid things like, like, what about the shopping? And, and also I was thinking I'd never see my mum and dad again for a hug. Now Jane knows she's a captive. She's absolutely terrified. She's on a car going somewhere she doesn't know where. So what's her psychological state like? Well, the first aspect of it is she is hypervigilant, picking up all the cues around her because she's trying to interpret them to give emotional significance to them. She wants to know what's going to happen to her. But she's trying to use her training to structure it up in some way, to remember more about the situation so that if she gets freed, she'll be able to tell people about it. It's a kind of classic hostage situation. She remembers about the frozen food in her bag. It's this attempt to structure and control her thoughts, to stop them running away with her. She doesn't want to think the worst at this point in time. So she's trying to think about the really normal things of everyday life, about will, will this frozen food, will it be usable will, you know, when I eventually get free? Jane managed to worm her way free of the sleeping bag. Twice, fearing discovery, her attacker stopped the car to cover her up. I thought about trying to escape, but I couldn't work out how to do that without getting killed. You know, because if I did manage to jump out of the car, then there was a good chance the car behind would just run into me. After about 20 minutes, Jane felt the car turn onto a bumpy road. What do you want from me? You'll find out. The car stopped. I had the impression he was opening a, a metal gate. Then suddenly the rear door was opening and he took a white T-shirt and pulled it over my head. <laughs> and then he got back in the car and, and drove on down a, a rough track. So what's the psychological effects of this so far? He's abducted her at knife point. He's blindfolded her. He's taken her to a remote location. She doesn't know where she is. And if she were to escape at that point, where would she go? Who would she trust? So this is all about extreme disorientation and him exerting power over her. Now, why would he want to do that from a psychology point of view? Because he wants her cooperation. Jane had yet to learn what cooperation with her attacker might entail and what further means of persuasion he might have in store. After a few hundred yards, we stopped again. He turned off the engine. Her journey was over, but the true horror was just about to begin. A summer's day in the sleepy Suffolk town of Brandon at the edge of Thetford Forest. For one 21-year-old girl, an ordeal which had begun there 20 minutes earlier in a supermarket car park was about to become far worse. I was absolutely terrified. I was having panic attacks and, and difficulty breathing. I didn't know where I was or what was about to happen. Jane is being played by an actress to protect the identity of the real victim. She wants her story told to encourage other victims to come forward. She'd been abducted at knife point and driven to an unknown destination by an older man who'd asked her for help, lifting a bag into his car. She'd willingly played the role of Good Samaritan. It was a trap. He pulled me out of the back of the car. Again, he threatened me with a knife, and then he untied my feet. Blindfolded by a T-shirt, she strained every sense to try and work out where she might be. She felt from the breeze against her body that she was close to open countryside. I couldn't really see anything in front of me, but I could see a little of the ground. I could see rocks, it was, it was really rocky. And then I realised he wanted me to step up onto something, a reddish orange milk crate in front of me. It was being used as a step up into something. And then I saw a silvery metal door frame. Turn right! Despite the pressure, she was still determined to remember every detail potentially vital in bringing her attacker to justice. I was aware of the floor echoing underneath my feet, 
So I knew I was in a caravan or a, a temporary building of some sort. So Jane is now in the attacker's lair. He's got her exactly where he wants her, both geographically and much more importantly, psychologically. He's got total control of her. She's nowhere to go. She's terrified. The only way out is for her to cooperate. It was a bedroom, a tiny, stinking space with a bed covered in filthy, rumpled sheets and blankets. It smelt of his body odour, his unwashed skin, and it stank of smoke from cigarettes, that overpowering. And yet there was lots of pink in there, as if it had been a girl's room. What do you want from me? <laughs> All I want is to make love to you. When he used those words, make love to me, I was terrified and revolted. And, but it also made my flesh crawl. You know, this was a man who'd kidnapped me at knife point. A man capable of violent mood swings, who had already demonstrated he was physically far stronger than Jane. What if I don't? <laughs> see? What do you see? Outside the window, there was some grass, and over to one side, there was water, possibly a lake. Um, and in the middle of this grass, positioned exactly so I could clearly see it, with some mounds of freshly dug earth, and next to them was a hole. What that is, is a grave. And if you're not a good girl, that's your grave. Fear just drenched me. But what went through my mind when he said that when I really thought he was about to kill me, was that I was absolutely determined to see my family again. I knew I had to do whatever it took to get back with them. This is a horrible psychological move on his part. He shows her physically the grave. So he's kind of directing her thoughts. He's putting thoughts in her mind. So this is about power and abuse of power and mind control. Jane saw something else when she looked from the window, the absence of any habitation. If she screamed, she knew there might be no one to hear. One of the most horrible parts about what happened was his tone. You really are so lovely. I love the shape of your neck. Like right from the start, he was loving and horribly intimate. Well, this must have been the, one of the worst moments for Jane because suddenly we've got this kind of switch from this kind of violent, extreme violent, fear-based situation to something which is kind of, in which the words and the, and the actions are all about love and, and romance and so on. And of course, this is just his fantasy. You know, he wanted someone to play this kind of love game with him. He kept calling me darling and was hugely complimentary about me at every tiniest part of my anatomy. He commented on everything in detail and, and praised everything. You got beautiful toes. I was so revolted, I kept thinking I was going to be sick. But I knew I couldn't be because, because that might flip him again into being aggressive or violent. The thing he might be craving, of course, is some kind of intimate relationship with another human being. And perhaps because of the way he is, his social skills, his personality, his looks, whatever, he can't achieve that in real life. So how does he go about a trying to achieve this? He goes about trying to achieve it by forcing someone to go along into his fantasy world with him. He's literally dragging someone into this fantasy world. But from her point of view, she'll just be thinking, I didn't anticipate this happening. What else could happen next, which I also can't anticipate? As the afternoon wore on, he became reflective. Mention of his life outside the caravan suggested to her he might be prepared to open up emotionally. He seemed to want to keep talking, so I began to think that maybe if I appealed to his human side, then maybe I could get out of this. Why me? Jane had been in the caravan with this man for quite a while. 
but she kept looking for sort of two things. One, you know, she had the eye on survival all the time, but she was also you know, looking for those little hooks that might improve her situation. So I started to think of stories I could tell him that might persuade him to let me go. I told him my boyfriend will be coming back from Afghanistan and will be waiting for me. So would my family. Well, this is classic captor-captive relationship here. What the captive has to do is to make the captor think of them as a human being, a rounded human being, with emotions, thoughts, a biography, a narrative, a life. And of course, what the captor has to do is to think of them as a one-dimensional thing, as something they're going to use, in this case, to fulfill his fantasy. So what Jane did was exactly right, to get this guy to think of her differently. I'm really sorry, but it's getting so late. I'm supposed to be going with my family to see my granddad. He's dying in hospital. Now, of course, people who have to imprison people professionally, like prison guards, the army, whoever, they have to kind of bulletproof themselves from this process. Because in some sense, if you're going to keep someone captive, you have to kind of think of them in a particular way. You have to control your thoughts as much as they have to do. Have you got kids? He wasn't trained to withstand this. So, in a sense, Jane did find his Achilles heel here. I've got a wife, a son, a daughter and a grandchild. I asked him more about his grandchild and I saw the evil drain from his eyes. This was a turning point in the, the ordeal for the victim, albeit very, very, you know, very traumatic and scary. After further conversation, Jane's attacker allowed her to get dressed, but she was still at his mercy, miles from anywhere and with the ever-present threat of his knife. It certainly didn't mean that she was, was safe and you know, everything else was going to be OK. You know, these were serious offences. There was a lot at stake for, for this man, so she had no way of knowing at that point whether anything else was going to happen or whether she was going to survive this ordeal. There was a moment when he thought about his wife finding out about what he'd done and he started to panic. And I know I still might not get away. He knew I could identify him. And I was still really frightened he'd kill me. I was extremely nervous. Should have gone to Specsavers. I heard myself joking with him. That line from the advert. I was shocked to hear myself saying it, but I was just so nervy, I didn't want the mood to change back again. Are you going to tie me up again? Not if you behave. But he did put the T-shirt over her head, determined to hide the location from her. Our sudden movements. In the corridor, Jane saw only the cups and taps in the kitchenette. she was placed back in the car. Though he didn't use the rope, he once more pulled the sleeping bag over her body. Jane's problem here is that she can't relax at this point in time. She knows her abductor is capable of dramatic mood changes. He's very volatile, very unpredictable. This is definitely the time not to relax. One thought that kept me going was my parents. I was absolutely determined that I'd have a hug from them again. From my dad, my mum, my sister and my boyfriend. It was a nightmare. I could not for one second let go of the fear that he might kill me. Jane's attacker had from the start displayed dramatic mood swings, from threatening to kill her and showing her a freshly dug grave to being loving and intimate. I heard the lighter. Immediately, my mind started racing. I was covered in the sleeping bag. I thought he might set light to the material and just leave me to burn. Then, after a few moments, I could hear the sound of a cigarette being smoked and could smell it. Eventually, Jane's attacker's car left the countryside and pulled into an industrial estate. He said if I moved my elbows, he'd come back and kill me.
Jane was back in Brandon, ironically having got herself into trouble by acting as a good Samaritan, when she begged passers-by for help, none gave it. One woman crossed the street to avoid her. Eventually, she reached the nearest safe place she could think of, her boyfriend's parents' house. I guess I could have gone to my car, but I just wanted to be with people I knew who could protect me. But there was no one there. When her boyfriend's parents did return home 20 minutes later, his mother scarcely recognised her. What's happened to you? Jane blurted out what had happened, but her boyfriend's parents couldn't take it in. They called Jane's parents to tell them of the attack. Where is she? And they contacted the police. At that point, we weren't to know that Jane was going to turn out to be what I'd describe as a, a perfect witness. And when I say that, I mean that her power of recall and the detail of the information she was going to give us was going to be the driving part in this investigation. Jane was taken to a safe house with her mum and her boyfriend's mum. She was eventually seen by a male doctor for a full examination, as no female doctor was available. I was determined not to lose any evidence till the doctor arrived, so I didn't wash, despite the fact that my flesh was crawling and I was desperate for a shower. And I didn't go to the loo, even though I hadn't been since morning and it was now past midnight. After the doctor came, they said I could shower using their facilities and get changed. Finally, she was allowed back to her parents' house. I absolutely scrubbed myself raw when I got home as well. I even felt like shaving my head to get rid of the feeling that I could still smell my attacker. I insisted someone sat on the other side of the shower curtain because I couldn't face being alone. I kept having flashbacks about what happened. The medical examination recovered body fluids believed to be the attackers. The samples were sent for analysis. A partial DNA profile was obtained. Um, unfortunately for us, the, the fact it was a partial profile meant there was insufficient material to, to make an identification on the National DNA Database to give us a potential suspect. The next day, Jane gave a statement to police. Her interview lasted for nearly nine hours. So I had this white, white T-shirt on my head and he um, She was able to give incredible like detail of the, the course of events, some really essential things that we were able to use um, effectively as we went through the investigation. She, she described what she perceived to be the road surface, that every turn, the junction, stopping at junctions, for instance. The detail was immense. Some details are remembered forever, and these things are called flashbulb memories. There's a very primitive bit of our brain which responds to traumatic situation and says, never forget details of this situation even when you want to. So aspects of the abduction, Jane would remember for all time. But of course, other bits are normally forgotten almost immediately. It's almost as if these things are too painful and we repress them. What's impressive about Jane is that those bits that we would normally repress, she has consciously said, I must remember those because they're the bit that are going to help the police. So she's used a force of will to remember bits that our brain automatically wants to suppress. Even though my army training wasn't specific to anything I was experiencing, it gave me something to hold on to. I thought, what would my army trainers tell me to do in this situation? And I did it. After the interview, Jane at last spoke to her boyfriend. He'd been away all weekend and I hadn't been able to contact him. The first thing he said to me was that he loved me. It wasn't what I was expecting him to say at all. How could anyone love me or, or want me after what I'd been through? I felt like used goods, you know, filthed up and worthless. I allowed him to give me a, a little cuddle, but, but that was all I could stand. I, I just couldn't cope with the physical contact. And the strangest thing was, it was the same with my dad, too. Even though what had been keeping me going was the thought of a hug from him. When it came to it, I, I just couldn't face being held. And it was so sad because, because this was Father's Day. That night, I just couldn't sleep. I couldn't get my attacker's face out of my head. 
So at four o'clock in the morning, I went to the bathroom and made a sketch of him on a notepad. I just wanted him out of my head and on the paper. Police put together an e-fit based on Jane's description of her attacker. They began collecting CCTV footage, but there was no tape in the cameras at the supermarket that day. Officers made house-to-house -house inquiries and handed out flyers with descriptions of the abduction and the vehicle. Jane gave us some really good detail regarding the, the vehicle she was taking in. She was able to give us what she thought was the make and model, the age of the vehicle, how the, the seats were put in the back, the way the door opened, um, she was able to describe the spoiler at the front and the spotlights that were on the spoiler. We thought at that point that would be a, a really useful lead for us um, and something that we could work on. Unfortunately, when we started to look at the number of um, vehicles in that age category, just in that Brandon area um, of that make and model, we soon realised that was an uphill task in numbering hundreds of vehicles. Fortunately, detectives had the rich store of further detailed information from Jane. One of our main tasks was to determine where the offence might have occurred, where this caravan was. We knew the starting place was Brandon. Jane said that the journey time was 20 to 25 minutes. Officers were dispatched from Brandon to drive for that amount of time in every direction. We then drew an outer limit. We checked that with the route finder capability on the internet. That gave us about 450 square miles. They needed to narrow this large area down. The flat Suffolk countryside round Brandon is home to RAF and United States Air Force bases. Detectives quickly established there was no way the attacker had a caravan on their land. Big private estates were also eliminated, as were built up areas, because Jane had described the location as rural. But a vast area remained detectives attempted to follow Jane's detailed list of twists and turns. This is um, Tesco's in Brandon. This is the Rattlers Road um, entrance to the car park. And you can see that um, red, red fence over there. Towards the end of there, that's at the end of that fence in a parking space is where the suspect abducted the victim from. And the victim's perception from the movements of the vehicle was actually exited via the London Road exit, which is um, to our right over there. But following Jane's list to the letter failed to match geography on the ground. Police began to wonder if her attackers manoeuvring in the car park had disorientated her from the start. Very quickly it became apparent to us that you know, it, it must be very, very difficult to actually know whether you are turning left or right or whether you've stopped at a junction. Um, you know, you, you, if, you, if your, your senses are blindfolded, under immense stress from just the you know, the, the sheer terror of being abducted like that at night point. Jane had mentioned hearing shooting, and the public responded with information on local gun clubs. But there turned out to be quite a few active on Saturday afternoons. Police also asked about old, caravan-style homes, but no one had seen any. Detectives needed a different tack. We utilised the Suffolk Police Force helicopter and indeed let's do a search based purely on what the victim had given us from the interview. Jane had mentioned key details that might be visible from the air. The mobile home itself, dark soil colour, rocky ground and the vehicle. We found a similar vehicle, what we, we believe to be hidden up in a, uh, in a wooded area, um, in, a, in some rough land. You know, well, well hidden off the road and um, was quite exciting at that stage, but um, it needed checking out and we checked it out and um, soon eliminated it from our inquiries. The first helicopter search had drawn a blank. For the second, the plan was to focus on Jane's recollection of water near the caravan, picking out canals, rivers, lakes. The team moved to the area immediately north of the patch searched first, and 10 miles from Brandon, in a remote area near the village of Hockwold cum Wilton, they made a discovery. We did identify a premises which seemed to have all the, the key ingredients that, that the victim had described, you know, the track leading to it, 
the fact there was a metal gate um, some way down this track and then the, the track continued on to actual fact there was, where there was a mobile home. And there, visible from the helicopter and tucked beneath the mobile home, something which appeared to match a key detail recalled by Jane, the reddish-orange milk crate at the doorway. Trevor and his investigation team needed to check out the location on the ground. Once again, they drew on the detailed information provided by Jane. She described a certain length of time on the road and then turning off in a bumpy track like this one here and, um, you know, driving down this track um, for a certain length of time. The victim describes that she's taken out of the vehicle at the, uh, the sexual attack scene and um, her head's covered, but she, she can feel the wind around, around her face and her body and has got the perception that she's in open countryside, just like sort of we're in, in here now. One piece of the jigsaw at a time and um, a place fitted exactly. And as you can see, just ahead of us here, um, where those trees are ahead, uh, where she was taken. The mobile home spotted from the air had trees at its back, but in front was an expanse of lake and open countryside. The team of officers approached. We had a meeting beforehand to make sure we had all our plans in place, just in case the suspect should come back when we were there, we couldn't get in, we needed to secure it. So that when they did actually go, we knew that we could deal with whatever situation we came across. You're entering into the unknown. Who knows, the offender actually might be inside there. So, you know, you, you're going with that in your mind. The caravan was exactly as Jane had described. When we looked through that caravan window into the bedroom area, I, I was 100% certain we'd found our scene. Trevor was on the phone saying, I've had a look in the window, and from what Jane had told us in interview, he was really certain that was the caravan. And he said to me, having looked in the caravan, he'd had to sort of take a couple of minutes just because of the detail of a description of what he'd seen. There was just no hesitation on his behalf that we had the right place. It just had to be it, and um, it was an immense feeling because it actually put us one step closer to um, apprehending our suspect. Police spoke to the owner of the land. It turned out he'd already phoned them after seeing the description of the attacker, one of 200 calls they were still working through. He had his suspicions that somebody who worked for him matched the description we'd given out, not necessarily the EFIT, but at least the descriptions, even to the extent that he'd sort of ticked off the various points we put on the, the description against the person working there. The caravan was used by a man in his 50s, the water bailiff who looked after the lake. His name was Robert English. He was tracked down to an address in Norwich. He was also linked to the vehicle used in the abduction. He was arrested as he left his house. Police hoped they had their man, a profound relief to Jane. But her nightmare, which began with abduction and continued with rape in a filthy caravan, was not over. I feel I've been betrayed by the justice system. So now I'm left not only dealing with the trauma of past events, but with the fear of what might happen next. A police helicopter search identified the grimy caravan where it was alleged the assault took place. English was a water bailiff, guarding the fishing lake nearby. Jane, whose part is being played by an actress, had remembered a wealth of detailed information, helping police identify her attacker. If at any time you feel uncomfortable or you, you want to walk around... English was taken to Bury St Edmunds Police Station, where he was questioned for nearly seven hours. The interview with Robert English was vital for us and there was a great deal of planning that went into that before we actually started. We suspect you that on the 14th of June at Brandon, unlawfully and by force, took, carried away against her will. Okay? That's what we're saying that you are responsible for. I chose to monitor that interview as it went on um, by use of a video camera within the room that I could watch from a remote location so that we could look at body language, we could look at his response to questions to make sure we were going in the right direction that we were picking up in those issues which seemed to rattle him, if you like, uh, and, and get reactions. Initially, English denied everything. I've got nothing to hide, so you'll only ever hear the truth. 
Okay, well that's all we're here for is to, oh, thank you. Yeah. to hear the truth. He was quite happy to talk to us at that point. Now, the offences of uh, kidnap and rape, how would you view those offences as a person sitting here arrested on suspicion of those offences? Awful. Sorry? Awful. Awful. We, first of all, allowed him to, to give his life story to us, to say, you know, right back from school, really, to build up to the current time as to what he'd done. I don't think he felt under too much pressure. We were asking fairly friendly questions. We weren't hitting him with the, the evidence of the offences themselves. The purpose of this interview is to get your version of events, to get your account. The technique was to feed Robert English rope so he could hang himself. Once he'd given enough information, police cut off his escape routes. He'd already come out with a, a set story that he wanted to stick to, which we can then challenge the facts on. When they asked if he'd ever been to Brandon, he said no, but police had been contacted by a woman who'd seen the EFIT. English had shown her round the lake the Friday before the attack, and she'd later seen him looking around Tesco's in Brandon the night before the abduction in the car park. Also, he said he'd returned home early that afternoon but CCTV footage showed his car passing through Brandon as he returned to drop Jane off at 6.30 p.m. At that point, his, his attitude to us changed completely, and from speaking fairly openly to us, he decided then not to answer any of our questions. But police had other evidence. Jane had identified English at an ID parade. There was the partial DNA match, and crucially, when English was examined, there were the mole and cigarette burn exactly as she'd described. At the end of that process, we felt we had sufficient evidence to charge him with kidnap, with false imprisonment, and with a number of rape and sexual offences. The police operation was unbelievably efficient. They tracked him down and left him no escape. And right from the start, they were incredibly kind and understanding. I know a lot of rape victims fear to come forward because they worry about how the police will treat them or about low conviction rates for rapists. But after my experience, I would absolutely urge any victim to contact the police. It's the only way to get rapists locked up so they can't do it again. English was tried at Ipswich Crown Court, where he pleaded guilty to kidnap, false imprisonment, sexual assault, assault by penetration and two counts of rape. He was sentenced to life and told he'd have to spend a minimum of seven and a half years in prison. For the police, this was a job done. They were commended by the judge. From when the offence was reported to us to the time we charged Robert English was just over four weeks. Um, and in that sense, there was a real team pride in, in being able to, to bring that person to justice in that timescale and also some relief, particularly on my behalf, that we'd managed to find the person responsible for that crime, knowing that they weren't then free to be um, committing crimes against other people. But for Jane, the fact Robert English would be released in a few years was a worry, and it didn't seem adequate after abduction at knife point and the extended sexual assault. When he was put behind bars, I felt relief. Although I wasn't too happy he could be getting out in just over seven years. I'll be living with the trauma of what happened for the rest of my life. For months I had panic attacks. I jumped if anything sudden happened. I was wary of every man on the street. It also made it extremely hard to rebuild a loving relationship with my boyfriend and to try and lead a normal life. But I was getting somewhere with that. But that wasn't the end of the story. Robert English decided to challenge his minimum sentence. He got it reduced by the Court of Appeal to five years, four months. That meant he'd be out in four years, four months, given the time he'd already served. I couldn't believe it. I felt betrayed. I can't fault the police in any way, but I feel so badly let down by the courts. How viciously does someone have to treat you before they're locked up and put out of harm's way? 
How am I supposed to cope when that man is released and I have to live with the fear he'll come looking for me? All I have left is to campaign for sentences, not just in the case of Robert English, but for all such rapists, which actually take into account the damage they've done and put the victim first. I think the sentence is really important because it reflects society's judgment on the seriousness of what's happened. Jane has bared her soul here going through the trial and she wants to feel that society empathises with her and understands how genuinely traumatic this was. And I think the problem is if the sentence is not adequate, she will feel that people didn't kind of get it, they didn't understand it, they didn't show enough empathy with what she'd been through. And I think the point about justice is it's an absolutely core bit of the human psyche. It's really important that our version of events and our account of our suffering is accepted. If not, and if you think that this, the sentence is not adequate, it's almost as if you've been a victim twice and nobody wants to be there. At the end of the day, this was an evil, terrible thing that happened in the most mundane of surroundings. English told me why he did it. He said he'd see me in the supermarket and he just had to have me. I mean, obviously he'd carefully planned to abduct somebody, but he chanced on me. It was that simple. I was dressed in ordinary clothes on an ordinary shopping trip and my world became a nightmare. Knowing that, going anywhere, anytime feels a risk. But when Robert English is free, how will I ever be?